Welcome to the fourth lesson of the course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils and ecosystems at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. We will make sure we'll turn this presentation into a PDF so you have access to all the links and you don't have to take notes while we are going through it. So this is the good news part. So we talked about why investing in regenerative agriculture in the previous video, which I will link below. And we talked mostly about the we talked mostly about the risks, the risks of extractive agriculture, the risks of investing in extractive agriculture and food. This video, this lesson will be about the opportunities. So the good news part. So if you've made it so far, you're you're ready for some for some good news. This is not investment advice. Seek professional investment advice, financial advice before making any investments. So now to the fun part. Why invest in regenerative agriculture? I think a lot of investors, impact investors that want to have impact, I think all investors want to have impact, not many just want to have financial impact, but are looking for a positive net impact. All investments we make have a negative impact as well. Could be the silicon we use for the solar panels, could be the energy we use to produce them, could be the um, diesel we use in the tractor, even though we have a no-till system, we still use a non-electric tractor, it could be et cetera, et cetera. But we're looking for the highest possible net positive in, uh, impact. And I would argue also deeper impact, system change impact. It's not for all, but for some that's really driving them. And we're gonna look at this from three angles, risk, return, and impact. We've looked at the risk part of extractive agriculture, degenerative, destructive agriculture. We're gonna look at the return now, which I see as the opportunities, the financial and the non-financial returns. And then we're gonna look in the next video on, we're gonna look at impact. So this is the exciting news. Um, a lot of this comes from a brilliant white paper that I mentioned before uh, in the other video as well, written by Paul McMahon, SLM Partners in 2016, but it's still super, super uh, present, urgent, uh, and, and didn't age, it aged really, really well, didn't age at all, basically. The investment case for ecological farming. So what are the seven interesting things about investing in regenerative agriculture. You get comparable or better yields. We'll go into all of these uh, in a minute. Lower operating costs. You're enhancing natural capital. Climate resilience gets more um, important every day. Positive environmental externalities. And maybe even in the future, you can get paid for them. There are some experiments happening there, actually quite a lot. The ability to sell your produce, the, the stuff that comes from the farm, your food, your fibers, your oil for a higher, into higher value markets, higher profitability with less volatility. So we're back to the risk part as well. Less volatility is obviously interesting. And just if you think, why are we not all farming indoors? Why are we not all um, looking for technology solutions? I think it's important to understand the limitations of that. We're gonna discuss it in another one. Uh, but it's also, there's a nice quote of Victor Friedberg, the founder of Foodshot Global, on why they focus on soil, the first food, food shot they organized. It's hard to imagine any future that has 10 billion people eating healthy and sustainably, of which soil is not part of that future. Like whatever we do, we need to take care of our soil and we need to regenerate our soil because we're running out. So let's go to the seven different points. Comparable and better yields. This is probably already shattering some worlds in a sense that we always hear, but organic cannot feed the world and how are you gonna feed the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at agroecological practices, which is sort of the umbrella term for a lot of the work we're doing, there's actually some very interesting data. In most cases, you get comparable or better yields, which is a bit shocking, but if you look at some of the studies, it's actually very shocking, mostly outperforming. In terms of productivity, when we look at the yield, there are many examples in grain, in livestock, in agroforestry, like grain and walnuts, in tropical agroforestry, where it's completely outperforming any monoculture you can possibly imagine. So don't let anybody tell you you cannot produce yield with regenerative agriculture. Lower operating costs. Because, of the le because you're less reliant on external inputs, you have a lower operating cost. You could have a lower operating cost. Many have more hands that are needed on the farm. Many have other costs, but many also are not buying the super expensive chemical inputs anymore. And remember, farming is a margin business. It's not an output yield business. Profitable farmers look at their margins. They look at the, the, um, the input cost and they look at the output, but they don't own, only look at the yield. You're increasing the value of natural capital. 
especially if you own the land. And these are a lot of investment opportunities, a lot of ways of investing are around this, and we'll look at that in um, a number of upcoming videos. But you can compare it with a real estate um, investment. If you buy a rundown building, you fix it up, you make it very energy efficient, you put the LED, uh, the LED lights in, the solar panels, etc., and then you're renting it out. The value of your asset has increased compared to when you bought it. If you buy a very, very degraded piece of land and you, through management, um, increase the soil carrying capacity, increase the organic matter, um, increase the water carrying capacity, increase the stocking rate, et cetera, et cetera, increase the number of trees, the value of the land increases. Climate resilience. Healthy soils go better with droughts and, so, and droughts and floods. And they're happening more and more. And if you look just two pictures next to each other, these are two side-by-side -side fields in Indiana. One with no-till, five years of cover crops, and the other one, conventional minimum till. Imagine what happens when a drought hits. I mean, you can just see the two pictures, just compare them in terms of um, surface. At the end, the farmer is trying to take as much sunlight as possible and turn it into sugars, turn it into something useful. So the more, the more leaves you have, the more sunlight you can capture. So you can just compare the two pictures here, how much um, surface is there to take sunlight and turn it into something useful. I think we, we can all agree which one wins. Positive externalities. There's a whole nascent market, and we'll show some, some examples, that is starting to, to rally around paying farmers for water storage because healthy soils store more water, biodiversity increase, and other environmental outcome, environmental outcome bonds, social impact bonds, carbon credits, carbon removal, et cetera, et cetera. A few examples, we have interviewed Nori actually on the podcast. We are interviewing Soil Heroes. We interviewed Regen Network completely at the beginning and we should definitely do a check-in interview. Maybe when you see this, we already did. So do check in. And these are all marketplaces that are uh, coming around basically to try to pay farmers for one or, or multiple um, ecosystem services. Full disclosure, I'm an advisor at Soil Heroes. There are also specific marketplaces coming up like the ESMC, uh, where the known Cargill, McDonald's, Syngenta and General Mills are part. And actually they get quite a bit of, um, uh, they get quite a bit of attention as well. We do a full video on um, this part of the market, like the ecosystem services and how to pay farmers for ecosystem services in an upcoming lesson. Higher price. In some cases, but this market is quickly growing, you can get really good premiums. If you're certified organic, if you're certified grass-fed and grass-finished, it's really interesting in looking at these niches. Just to give you an example, only 6% of the food consumed, or only, already 6% of the food consumed in the US is organic, but only actually less than 1% of the farmland is certified organic, which means a lot of international inputs, which means that if you are farming organically certified in the US, especially grains, if you look here, you can get a really, really nice premium. Last 15 years, 50 to 200% price premium over non-organic. The last 10 years, so from 2010 until now, it has been 100 to 200%. That's life-changing. Even if you have slightly lower yields and you see many, many farmers actually closing the yield gap, especially in difficult drought years, et cetera, they're getting the same yields consistently as their neighbors that are not organic or not regenerative. You get a very, very nice premium, and again, it's about the margins, which means if your sell price is a lot higher and your input costs are a lot lower, you means you're, you're running a much, much more interesting business. So it can be a lot more profitable with less volatility. And I don't have to explain, I think, why volatility is, could be quite deadly for, um, for, your, comp for your investments. So just to close with two studies, uh, there are not so many actually connecting profitability um, with regenerative agriculture. It's very difficult to study because you need comparable groups. It's, it's tricky to do, um, but there are some, some interesting studies coming out. Actually, one is done by Soil Capital in Belgium, and they saw that the best farmers outperformed with 30,000 euros a year, which is an enormous amount for any farming family. And they were actually also the best ones if you look at the greenhouse gas performance, meaning they stored most carbon. You can find the link in, uh, um, in one of the last slides if you want to dig deeper. Another one, this is a very full slide, I'm sorry, um, is one of the few studies that I found for 2018 connecting regenerative agriculture to profitability. So they saw in the leading grain or regenerative grain operations, a 29% lower grain production, which is a lot lower, but you, you've, I've already asked Jonathan about that and you see actually they're closing the yield gap and this doesn't take into account potential livestock that's grazing on it, et cetera. It just looks at the grain. 
but they had a 78% higher profit. And the profit was positively correlated to the organic matter in the soil, not the yield. So the yield, which we all look at and who's the most bushel per acre, et cetera, et cetera, is actually not a very good indicator if you want to look at profit, which if as an investor, you want to invest in farms, invest in farmers, obviously profit is an important piece. And probably the most shocking piece of this actually was that the pests were tenfold more abundant in the insecticide treated fields, meaning the corn farmers that were spraying chemicals against the pest had 10 times more pests on their field compared to the regenerative farms that weren't spraying and were actually doing different management practices to keep the pests under control. 10 times, you know, not two, three, 10 times. So if you want to dig deeper, definitely read the investment case for ecological farming um, by Paul McMahon. If you click on this link, it downloads the PDF straight away. Um, there's a very interesting TEDx talk of Gabe Brown. Um, if you click on here, you will go to the YouTube channel so Capital, the research, what I mentioned, the Medium post will have, with a lot more information is there. If you want to read the paper of Don, Dr. Jonathan Lundgren that I just mentioned um, with both the insects and the profitability, go to uh, the PRG website or go to our website where you can hear the full interview with him. And if you want to know more about the Cargill um, marketplace, go to the GreenBiz website. What's next? We're going to look at why the impact side of things. So... I hope you follow me also in the next video. And just to conclude, any feedback is welcome. Please find us in the comments below, go to Twitter, go to our website, Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and fill out the form, um, email me, I mean, reach out and please let us know what you think of these. Again, please think about to pay what you think it's worth. You can find all the links to do 